now with the conclusion of our inaugural session, we transition into the heart of our discussions with the first panel discussion of the day. The topic at hand is Empowering Indian States, Unleashing Innovation Potential for Viksit Bharat at 2047. It is my distinct honor to invite Ms. Devjani Ghosh, President of National Association of Software and Service Companies, more popularly known as NASCOM, to preside over this insightful discussion as the chairperson of the panel. Ms. Ghosh's ex extensive experience and profound insights make her an ideal leader for navigating this critical conversation. Now, let us warmly welcome our esteemed panelists, each a luminary in their respective fields. First, I welcome Dr. Chintan Vaishnav, Mission Director of the Atal Innovation Mission. Dr. Vaishnav brings a wealth of experience and a visionary perspective to the intersection of innovation, education, and entrepreneurship. Next, we are honored to have Sri Anjan Das, Chief Policy Officer at Sterlite Technologies Limited, whose expertise contributes significantly to shaping policy landscapes in the industry. Joining our esteemed panel is Sri Anantha Narayanan, Senior Vice President and Chief Facilitation Officer at Invest India, who plays a crucial role in fostering investment and economic growth. Last but not the least, we have Dr. G. R. Raghuvendra, Senior Consultant, Department for Promotion of Industry and Internal Trade, that is DPIIT, whose experience contributes significantly to the topic. Everyone, and um, it's a tremendous pleasure to be here and uh, to listen to this amazing panel on a topic that is uh, very important for India right now, increasing the innovation quotient across states. So, you know, it was a wonderful inauguration session and uh, there were some really good insights that were shared on innovation, what's needed. Um, I have a very simple way of looking at innovation. Innovation is the thing that happens that, you know, when, when you see something that no one else does. And how you see it, the lens that you apply when you see um, what no one else is seeing determines uh, the, the type of innovation or the impact of that innovation. And where India has really differentiated itself when we talk about innovation, is when we see new things, when we see things that the world is not seeing, we see it with the lens of inclusion. We see it with the lens of grassroots upwards. And this is a very distinct difference between how the West views innovation and how India views innovation. If you see Western innovation, it traditionally will start at the top. Self-driving cars, taking people to Mars, and all sorts of things. It will start at the top with the hope that as economies of scale start playing up, uh, the innovation is going to scale down. In the last few years, what India has shown is that whether it's with DPI, uh, and, and you know the entire network of digital public goods that we have created, when we innovate, we innovate for the last mile. We innovate for the person sitting in a village so that that person does not get left behind. And then we are scaling up the innovation. And this is something that the world has definitely taken notice of. This is something that is making India today the inevitable partner in innovation for the world. In fact, recently, not, not recently, but um, you know, WHO called out that 1.6 billion people suffer from anemia, a condition resulting from reduced hemoglobin as a concentration in the blood, as we all know. 
This actually has prompted WHO to define the fight against anemia as one of its critical sustainable development goals of 2025. I'm not sure how many of you were aware of that, that a fight against anemia is one of the SDGs. One company has garnered a lot of attention and appreciation for their work in this area. And that company is Bosch. It's a German multinational company, a tech leader, and they have developed a game-changing solution that can pretty much you know, significantly contribute to the fight against anemia because it's a non-invasive, portable hemoglobin monitor solution that allows a large number of people to be screened very safely and without an invasive approach. And extremely cost effective, designed again to be used at the grassroots levels where access to good health care does not exist. Now while Bosch has got worldwide global acclaim for their thinking on this and coming out with this revolutionary product, any guesses where this work happened in Bosch. Yes, Bangalore. It was in India. And this is the story of innovation globally. You look at Airbus, you look at Mercedes, you look at Siemens, you look at Microsoft, you look at any multinational, one of the most innovative companies in the world. Their innovation is being driven either out of India, a large part of it, or their innovation is being driven by Indians. In fact, at NASCOM, we say that the I in innovation today has, is actually standing for India. It stands for India. I mean, and, and we have to think about why. Why is this happening? Yes, we have talent. We have tremendous talent that is highly adaptable. And that is the beauty of Indian talent. Indian talent uh, is able to unlearn and learn much faster than what you, what you see in the West or other countries. That's a, that's a very important skill to have, the ability to adapt, the ability to unlearn and learn. We've talked about, uh, Dr. Saraswa talked about the startup ecosystem, the deep tech up startup ecosystem, small but growing and very robust. And again, tremendously in demand globally because the kind of work that we are seeing, even in that small deep tech startup ecosystem in India, is catching global attention. Um, we have tremendous initiatives, and I would like to call out my favorite, which actually uh, Dr. Chintan uh, leads, which is the Atul Innovation Mission and the Atul Tinkering Labs. If anyone hasn't been to an Atul Tinkering Lab, I think you've missed out something in life. I mean, just being there, watching those kids playing, tinkering with the solutions, talking about problems, you know that your future is in good hands. I mean, that's one of the most fantastic things that we are doing, which is building that problem-solving mindset. And that brings me to the, you know, to the fourth aspect, which is the mindset. You cannot innovate if you, if you have the mindset of saying, I'll go with this, I accept this, status quo is okay. You need a mindset of challenging status quo. You need a questioning mindset. You need a mindset that's, that's seeking to solve problems. And thankfully, that's the mindset we are seeing right now in young Indians, India, where it's no more about this is legacy, so we live, we've done it this way for hundreds of years, so we are going to continue doing with it. That unfortunately was my generation, I think. But the next generation is saying, no, we need to change it. We need to make things better. And that is fantastic. And lastly, I think the role of the government is so important in all of this. The government of India has played a very supportive role. It's a pretty pro-innovation um, government, as the world says. In fact, I was recently in US and Europe, where there was a lot of discussion across both, uh, both continents on um, uh, AI regulation. And there was tremendous appreciation from industry across to say the Indian government's approach to AI and approach to AI regulation is very mature and very pro-innovation, of course, with the right oversights. So I think Indian government is seen as a very pro-innovation 
um, government which helps tremendously and which is obvious when you look at the kind of programs and support. But if we have to do something different, I think there are two things we really have to pay attention to. One, I think Dr. Saraswath talked about it. We need to increase deep tech patient capital in India. If there is one thing that India does not have, it is patient capital. We are dependent largely on the West to provide the capital for deep tech funding. And if the West comes in with money, you cannot blame them for funding projects or funding solutions that they feel that works for them and they want to take out of India. They are not going to look at funding solutions that is needed in the villages of India. And that is where deep tech can play a revolutionary role. So India does need to figure out deep tech funding, patient funding for deep tech, and which I think is one of the biggest challenges we have ahead of us. And the second role that the government has to play, you know, the biggest, biggest enemy of innovation in today's world, especially in today's world where AI is the foundational technology and data is pretty much driving everything, driving all innovation. The biggest enemy of innovation is silos. And unfortunately, we do have a lot of silos in India, between states, between government departments. And that is one of the biggest handicaps, I would say, that India has today when it comes to really game-changing innovation. And I think as government bursting the silos and figuring out how do we truly build that culture, that mindset, and that ecosystem of one India is going to be tremendously important. So these were just a few opening thoughts, and I would now request my esteemed panel to please um, share their thoughts. I think each of each one has 10 minutes. Um, I would really appreciate if you can focus on what is needed to empower Indian uh, states to unleash the power of innovation, specific solutions, specific ideas will be tremendously appreciated. Um, so with that, I'm going to start off with uh, Mr. Anjan Das, uh, Chief Policy Officer, Sterlite Technologies. Anjan. Thank you, Devjani. Uh, I am representing uh, a company called Starlight Technologies Limited, a leading optical and digital uh, infrastructure and solution company. Uh, just quickly, just to give a little introduction, uh, what we do. Uh, in the manufacturing excellence space, actually we are the first Indian company from end to end, from sand to optical fiber, manufacturing in Maharashtra and other places. We have 16 uh, global production facilities across the globe and CMMI level five uh, certification. Innovation excellence, which is core subject of this particular uh, uh, discussion today, uh, we have been spending for last many years 3% of our revenue in R&D. And, uh, uh, and, and then, of course, we can see you know, some results in terms of 650 plus patents per portfolio in our kitty. Uh, four innovation and R&D centers uh, in the country. Uh, sustainability goals, which is, of course, I think should be one of the goals of innovation. And we are the first company to achieve zero waste to landfill uh, from our manufacturing facilities and certain sustainability goals by 2030. So that's uh, just briefly uh, just wanted to mention. Coming to the subject, and I will stick to my time again. Uh, the subject is, I mean, for the panel, that for India to be Vikshit Bharat by 2047, I think among many other things, we need to really focus on that how India become innovation-driven economy by at least 10 years before 2047. That means by 2037, India has to be an innovation-driven economy or knowledge economy or innovation economy, whatever you want to term it. Now, there are many definitions of innovation-driven economy, but in simple format is that whatever investments we are making, whether from the government or the private sector or otherwise, in innovation, there has to be a return on these investments for economic and social development. Unless we are going to link these two aspects, because when we are talking about R&D, we never connect it to economic development. I think this is what is the disconnect, and Devjani talked about the silos. I think these silos are to be broken. So 
few other points I just wanted to make this connect visible. For innovation, there are many definitions, but I want to bring certain fundamental parameters of innovation, which is, of course, R&D and design together, intellectual property rights, startup ecosystem, and entrepreneurship and education. So there are four education, R&D, startups, and intellectual property rights. If we look at these four fundamental pillars and look at the what are the investments and the inputs we are making it today uh, in the country or otherwise. Dr. Sarasta talked about global expenditure in R&D, GRD, uh, which is less than 1%. We never crossed 1% in fact. And global average is almost double. And the unfortunate part is private sector investment in this total investment in R&D is around 30-35%. That's the, that's the major worry. And if you look at wherever there is a 2 or 3% investment happened in other countries, I think private sector has invested more than 60 to 70%. I think this particular gap we need to really bring up that what trigger or stimulants can make private sector to invest much more than what they are doing. Now, we have tested this tax remedies or tax holidays or tax rebates or providing R&D or investing in R&D for private sector, which didn't really make any much bigger results. I think we need to think this policy making also has to be innovative to see that how to trigger this private sector investments is much more than what is today. Now, can there be a champion industry concept? Can there be industries who would be supported by the government or topping up 50% of their R&D cost based on their track record? I think we need to really think of that output-based incentives for increasing R&D by the private sector. So this is one thing I just wanted to uh, make here. Now coming back to the main topic, which is the states, I think uh, there are three things I want to point out. One is if we see the states today, they are positioning them for attractive investments or branding is basic fundamental uh, factor-driven parameters, which are, you know, investment climate, the labor availability, incentives, land. I have never seen a state is positioning or branding a state for inviting or attracting investment is that these many world-class R&D institutions we have in the state. These many academic institutions, these many intellectual property centers, these many design institutions, these many startup incubation centers. I have never seen that. So I think we need to first thing is states have to make a strategic shift from conventional parameters to brand and position or prioritize to this innovation parameters. I think this is what is, is, is required. That's the number act one action. Number two action is prioritizing the goals. I think we need to really prioritize on their daily matters in the state government, uh, uh, wherever it is. Now, four or five things. One is that how to improve the academic excellence. We are talking about quality, we are talking about autonomy, we are talking about research intensity in the academic institutions. I think there has to be some major focus on this academic excellence. Second is R&D and design intensity. I think, I think this is very, very important and the most important. The institutions should also deliver for the development of the state who are located inside the states. I think we see a disconnect. We see a lot of great institutions are located in the states, but their contribution to the state's development is negligible. So how to make this connect? Uh, IPR ecosystem, there has to be some incentivization from the states for the IP owners to increase the IP owners from the state that how we can increase, I think, this policy making, I think machinery has to think about it. And vibrant SME sector, I think innovation and MSME sector are to be integrated element. I think majorly they have contributed to innovation ecosystem largely all over the world. So we have to bring them together. Now, finally, one or two points. I think we need innovation in policy making. And it is for the state governments more importantly. Now, for example, I can give you one or two examples that what could be innovation in policy making. For example, 
state government can invite private sector to come out or develop technologies and solutions for the problems states are facing with a co-funding formula. Now, private sector across the country and the globe will definitely come and join hand with the state government to solve real problems related to the states and develop new technologies and solutions. So 50% co-funding for technology development and R&D for the state's priorities. Just one example. Second example is intellectual property by the SMEs. I think this has to grow and, the, and the, from the state. Now there are talks that how this intellectual property can be mortgageable or collateral property for financial institutions to provide working capital or, or loan. Now, unless and until the small companies see intellectual property is also a collateral and mortgageable property, I think then government can play a role to provide some guarantees to the financial institutions to take that as a collateral, uh, collateral property. So, and then most importantly, public procurement system of new products and solutions. I think state government should also allocate 50% of their procurement from the new startups and the companies and the new technologies without the requirement of any past track record. So these are a few, few of the items, uh, I think. And lastly, I think each state should think of creating a innovation digital network to connect all the players to really eliminate the duplication of work and it, its efficiency. I think this is very important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anjan. That was excellent and very, very good su uh, suggestions, very specific, so really appreciate that. I would now re uh, request uh, Dr. Chintan Vaishnav to please say his words. Okay, it's a real honor to be uh, here with you. Um, the S&T Vertical and Niti Aayog and Atal Innovation Mission work very closely uh, and also under the uh, guidance of uh, Dr. V.K. Saraswat. Uh, so uh, I, I chose to use uh, slides because uh, uh, these pictures uh, may tell you uh, uh, more than the, my words can uh, describe. I'll still keep to my 10 minutes. I, I am trying to make a point if, if we can dim the lights uh, up front here, then you'd be able to see the slides better. Um, uh, welcome to friends from uh, states and the union territories. Um, so so uh, in, in this idea of unleashing pot innovation potentials, uh, you know, by empowering states and union territories, uh, let, let me pose uh, uh, this question to you. Can, uh, we, we have, as, as was mentioned, we have gone from uh, the rank of 81 uh, in 2016 uh, to the rank of 40 in 2022-23 uh, on the Global Innovation Index. Uh, the question is, uh, can we uh, go to the top 25 without states and UTs and center actively working together? Uh, I think the answer is absolutely a clear no. I mean, just very small demonstration of how the Global Innovation Index is made. Now, you may say, well, you may have opinion about whether this index is right, whether we should apply it, should we get something else, etc. cetera. But uh, uh, let's, let's assume that it, it is an index that currently drives the whole world. So we'll, we'll accept it uh, as it is. Uh, but if, if you look at uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 any of these categories that make up uh, this index, such as institutions, uh, infrastructure, uh, uh, market sophistication, um, uh, knowledge creation, any of these categories, you, you really can't think of any of them which, which where, where, where either states uh, slash UTs or the center can do it alone. So just by that argument, 
uh, we have to work together if we want to get to the top 25. Now let me show you some, uh, some pictures. Um, again, if we can dim these really bright lights here, We'll do better with pictures, but I'll, I'll go on anyway. Uh, so I'll show you a few few maps. Um, let me first tell you how to um, um, how to read these maps. So there are two maps you see on this uh, slide. Uh, uh, the one on the left is the total number per state or UT map. The one on the right is that same number per one lakh population in that state or UT. So in other words. States that are dark, both on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, are relatively doing better. Both numbers are high, and their productivity or job creation, because each startup creates about 10 jobs on average, is high. States that are dark on the left, but lighter in color on the right, those are states that have large numbers, but uh, the job creation per capita is not that high. And the third, states that are light on the left-hand side, but dark on the right, uh, those have uh, small numbers, but larger per capita job creation. So for instance, look at Haryana, uh, uh, darker on the right-hand side, right? Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, so, so there are real differences uh, in states is the, is the point uh, I want to make. Um, let, let me uh, show you another picture. This is the incubation picture. Same thing, a total number of incubators on the left-hand side per state in UT. The darker it gets, the more concentration there is. Uh, the, the per capita or per lakh population uh, incubators on the right hand side. Now if I were to use per million, then you will see at least one incubator in each place, right? Um, what is interesting here is that of course, this, the south is darker, right? That's, that's very clear. Um, but uh, there is some hue uh, all across the country. So, so there is incubation facility for somebody to go from an idea to a startup springing up everywhere, right? How much more of this do we need? Uh, well, there is a lot of regional imbalance. There is no, there's, there's, uh, that, that's, that should be very clear from this uh, picture, that uh, there's regional imbalance that we have to work on. Uh, bigger cities, easier to innovate, uh, smaller places, uh, harder to innovate, uh, and so on. But, but some things, are uniform. Uh, Dave Jani mentioned the Atul Tinkering Labs. Look at this map. We have built 10,000 Atul Tinkering Labs until now, trained 80 lakh students to the idea of innovation, entrepreneurship, etc., and about 10 lakh uh, projects we have done. This map alone traces the map of India. That's the work we have done. This, is, this part is uniform. So if you go across the states, I'm not showing you the patent map nor the participation map yet, but you will go across the state, about 4.5% of schools uh, in any state or UT uh, have uh, a, 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 an adult tinkering lab. So, so obviously, you can read it to, in two ways. First, that it's uniformly available. Second, that we still have to build it in 95% of the schools. Uh, but, but there's uniform opportunity at school level beginning to uh, happen if you just look at that percentage. But there are things that are not uniform also. This is a map, look at all the different colors on this. This is a map of who in a given state is the nodal department to work on startups. Look at the diversity. The highest number is the, uh, is the industries department, followed by IT, MSME, etc. Now, this map gets a little more complicated if you uh, go away from startup policy and augment also innovation piece because the education comes in, and so it will need multiple colors, which gets com complex to demonstrate. But the point I want to make is that 
uh, how we handle innovation across states and UTs is not uniform at the moment. The right hand side on the very far east is all planning departments. That's Niti Aayog. Thanks, thank you, Niti Aayog. Right uh, now, we can say that uh, non-uniform is okay. It's entrepreneurial. Uh, we got started where there was a good officer. We got started where there was the right environment. Uh, and uh, look, it's happening everywhere. That's fine. I think it's okay for let thousand flowers to bloom. We just have to decide that that's what we want. But we still need something more uniform at the higher level to articulate what is the ideal set of actors, who are the ideal set of actors who should be in this conversation in every state in UT, because at the very minimum, innovation has two legs to stand on, education and industry. If you want, if you don't like the instability of two legs, there is a third leg, which is the skill uh, uh, also, right? So this, we have to articulate at Niti Aayog, Atal Innovation Mission, we are resolute to articulate this. Uh, uh, to, about a, uh, a month ago, we had a three-day workshop on building state-level innovation ecosystem, which was a more hands-on workshop. Some of you may have been there. Uh, but this is something we have to work on, because if we don't work on it, we cannot get to the top 25 on the GII. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Vaishnav. That was fantastic. I have one question for you. I mean, that map um, of Atal Tinkering Labs was just fabulous. I mean, it, 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 it's just absolutely fabulous. What is the difference that you see when a school and, and you know, community is investing in these labs? Is, has there any study been done to say this is the impact that it creates? Yes. Uh, we are... Uh, we haven't published the results of it. So in this maybe a week or two, we will publish. We had a third party study of those labs uh, that were the first ones created and who mm. have now mm. been around for more than four years. And the results are very encouraging. Uh, I will not spill all the beans, but maybe I'll we'll spill some, <laughs> some beans. Shall please I sp do. spill yes, a do. bean? Uh, uh, so, about one-fourth of these labs have raised their own resources beyond what the guidelines needed them to spend. That is a thumping, I think, uh, 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 yep. thumping validation of what uh, we, we're trying to do and the engagement it has created. Fantastic. We'll wait for the results, but um, I think one of the things we need to do is ensure every, not just every state, but every district, every community um, starts embracing the concept of the adult tinkering labs. Actually, you are here from NASCOM. We need a uh, private sector to start building them. Let's talk. Yeah. We do. Um, we'll move on. Uh, I would like to now invite Ananta Narayanan from Invest India to please share his thoughts. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity uh, to present here to talk about uh, a pretty important topic and also opportunity to share the dice with my former boss and my current boss. Until last month, I was with Intel, heading the government affairs and public policy, and I recently joined Invest India. So what I'm going to do quickly in the 10 minutes that is given to me is to sort of give you a perspective on uh, why is innovation important, what is the, why it is critical for the states, some of the global challenges that we see today, plus also some of the things that uh, when policymakers, states decide that they need to start looking at, you know, differently when they're talking about innovation. Sorry about my boss, it's a little groggy. Uh, first of all, you know, I think the, the Prime Minister said when he said the India vision at 2047, we said that we want to target a GDP of about 30 trillion, which is about 10 times where we are today. So if you have to grow at 25, you know, from in the next 25 years to 10 times of whatever GDP is today, I think the 
emerging and critical technology will play a very significant part in terms of you know, us being able to reach that particular kind of level. Let me give an example. For example, AI alone is expected to sort of add about 15 to 16 trillion to the global GDP by 2030, right? Similarly, if you look at IoT, we'll add another 11 to 12 trillion, right? If you look at 5G, 6G, and the next generation communication technology, they will add another 15 trillion, right? So if you look at all the emerging technology, then you have EVs, robotics, automation, bio, genomics, right? So innovation becomes a very critical aspect for our, us to sort of you know, achieve our goal of you know, the 30 trillion economy by 2030, by 2047, right? Now, that is not a given for us, right? It is going to be challenged, right? Every country in the world is going to vie for that particular pie that is going to generate it. And, and the way we see it, now if you look at what is happening in the world today, right? Emerging and critical technology has become sort of a national security imperative for a lot of governments, right? Because it is critical and people who have the technology have the ability to control it, right? We have seen this in the Ukraine war and other wars that have happened, right? Where technology denial can happen, right? And, and those, and unless you control or unless you actually control a very significant part of that value chain, right? There is every possibility that you might not be able to really, you know, use that and then achieve your goal of GDP. That is first. The second thing, right? It is not just government, right? The other aspects that you need to look at in critical and emerging technology is unlike the past where technology used to come from the government, which is basically defense other into the private sector, I think that paradigm is completely changed, right? Today, critical, most of the critical and emerging technology happen within the private sector and they go into the government and the defense and other area, which means that there are a handful of companies globally which control and you also have the resources, you know, you know, equivalent to some countries to sort of use this stuff, right? So the market access and a lot of other things become critical. So um, let me give an example on the second part, right? I mean, if we have to uh, sort of think of, you know, not being getting trapped in, in a way that, uh, that, you know, technology might be denied or, or we not being able to use it, one is that we have to be fully atmanirbar in term when it comes to developing the core aspect of the most important value or in that value chain, right? We should be able to own it and have the capability within the country to develop it. For example, when it comes to AI, it's the models. We should be able to own all those models that are critical for that, right? So that is one critical aspect of it. The second thing is we need to have a large market where people can't deny you the technology. Let me give you an example. Recently when the US-China was happening, US did a lot of sanctions on China in terms of the sale of the GPU, general purpose prop that is used for AI development, right? What has happened is that China, I mean, there, there was a six week period between the government announcing a ban and you know, that ban coming into effect. Within that six weeks, China actually bought the entire supply of GPUs in the world that they did in the last two years. Which means that, right, today, if India wants to go and develop our AI program, there is no hardware supply for you for the next two years, right? So if you are a large market, even if companies do sanctions on you, right, there is a way that you can actually get through it because you are a large market that nobody can't sort of, sort of you know, overlook you, right? That's what really happened, right? So two things that we take away from this is one, we got to be able to develop our own ecosystem for developing those technology. Second thing is we got to be a large market that nobody can actually deny you that. Those two are critical aspects. So the next thing is to look at some of the factors that we should consider, right, in terms of while looking at innovation. Maybe this is where the policy makers can actually look at. Some of the critical stuff for innovation, uh, there are many, but I'll just highlight three, four. One is human capital. I think we got to be able to do human capital, uh, develop those human capital much better. Second thing is entrepreneurship and the R&D infrastructure. And the third critical part is actually the innovation ecosystem itself. Dr. Saraswat alluded to it, right? That ecosystem is actually critical, right? The fourth one is actually finance. Uh, these technologies are not cheap. I think they need a lot of you know, uh, finances, investments to, for you to be able to develop them. And again, while we are thinking of human uh, capital development, I, mean, I just want to give you a small nuance, right? India is actually ho is home to about 20% of the global semiconductor talent, okay? What that trans that does not mean, I mean, that has not translated to something that we've been having been able to own, design and develop our own products. 
what has really happened is that this talent is locked into companies that are not available for the general ecosystem, right? I think we need a way to unlock that talent to the, and trickle down to the ecosystem so that the ecosystem can actually take advantage of you know, the talent that companies are building. I think Dev Jani did talk about this, right? India is the place that you would go, right? And there are about 1,600 MNCs who have their you know, next generation R&D you know, facilities in India developing products for the world. But unfortunately, we have not been able to utilize all this talent. And that's where policy comes into place where we have to be able to look at how do you sort of unlock this value and do that. Second thing when it comes to uh, the ecosystem, right? I think today, I think we have a great startup ecosystem. We have a great scientific community what and, and, and academic community, right? What we've not been able to do is bring all these people together into a seamless way of working. That's where the ecosystem comes in. Unless we are able to take a research through its, uh, the startups, innovation, product, that life cycle in a very seamless way, including financing part for the part of it, right? We will still be scratching at the surface of the value that can actually you know, unlock, right? So it is actually critical to ensure that we have mechanisms in place, right? Or institutional structures in place where we can bring all the participants who are in this to create that value, right? Uh, there are very good examples. For example, the plugin that is done with IIT Mumbai is a good example. So there are many small examples. Maybe you start looking at you know, how do we do more. And the last thing is finance. Uh, investment is a very critical part. Uh, one of the things that you would uh, maybe, you know, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, is that if you're a startup and you are working significantly for government, it is very difficult to get funding simply because it is a very, very risky proposition, right? So we have to be able to facilitate some of those aspects for startups so that you know, they start flowing around. Maybe these are some of the thoughts that you should consider while you're doing your uh, policy strategies and other stuff, right? At Invest India, we are coming out with a lot of work related to you know, studying this value chain, emerging value chain, so that we'll be able to help you with understanding this value chain so that you, know, you can actually design your programs and policies accordingly. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ananta. And next we have Dr. G. R. Raghavendra, who is a senior consultant, IPR. Uh, Dr. Raghavendra, over to you. Vande Mataram, good afternoon to all the distinguished guests, and uh, it's really thrilling to speak before Dr. Saraswat sir and uh, Dr. Paul and all distinguished members of the Niti Aayog and uh, the distinguished panel here. I'm an intellectual property student. My uh, PhD is uh, IPR protection for artificial intelligence and text data mining, uh, both the inventorship of artificial intelligence and copyrightability of the uh, AI products. If innovation is not protected, whether uh, we can introduce a standalone trade secret law in India because we don't have all trade secrets or uh, undisclosed information in India is dealt through the uh, one small section of restraint of trade, section 27 of the Contract Act, uh, the normal common law principle of, uh, um, you know, which courts follow in case uh, there is no specific legislation is there. Uh, you know, if you look at the entire data, you know, my, uh, from Dr. Sarvasas to my friend Chintan, everyone spoke about how India, you know, moved from 2012 uh, to 2015 Global Innovation Index. That is 81st rank. Now, the latest rank shows that India is the 40th position. How it became possible, it became possible because the policies we implemented, because if you see a post-independence era, our science and technology innovation policy, of course, India has become now various uh, policies made India the third largest scientific pool. And then we have third largest PhDs, third biggest higher education system and ninth best quality as, uh, in case of uh, the uh, PhDs and publications of uh, you know, scientific R&D publications. Uh, and uh, we have huge scientific research pool. 
And if you see the last six years, women in the innovation, number of women in the innovation R&D has, you know, doubled. And, but still, why we are not matching, as Deb Janizi mentioned about the innovation, the high tech, because we always, you know, believe in technology transfer or licensing. This stereotyping we need to break. Luckily, we have a very dynamic and uh, leadership under the Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji. When he called for make in India, then all the policy changes took place. It all began with introduction of national IPR policy with the motto of Creative India and Innovative India in 2016. And, and that really, you know, started the uh, direction and one of the best things under national IPR policy, we have the leader of the Atal Innovation Mission who spoke be before me. And he has mentioned about uh, 10,000 attend tinkering labs. So when, uh, as a part of this national IP policy and make in India, another disruptive thing which hitherto, before 2014, neglected, that is the startup. When we started our startup policy, startup India policy in 2015, though everything has changed. And uh, when we gave the facility of expedited examination facility for the patents associated with the startups in the policy, we amended the rules, patent rules, to facilitate this. Why can't we amend patent rules to encourage kids, lakhs of kids working in the more than 10,000 Atal tinkering labs? So I just recently suggested to Piyush Goyal, sir, so we should introduce, amend the rules, introduce expedited patent granting to a kid below 21 years he must come with. He, he might come with some innovation. It is a patentable uh, subject matter. Why can't you give expedited, in, you know, patent granting to encourage those kids below 21? Similarly, the the person who is innovating above 65 need to be uh, promoted. Similarly, there are uh, drugs which are to be patented, which going to or help, uh, which are life-saving drugs. So those kind of drugs need to be given uh, expedited innovation. And there are people who are suffering from, uh, you know, life-threatening decisions, but they are, in, you know, contributing to the innovation. They have to be given expedited innovation uh, uh, and expedited grant of patents. So these kind of steps we need to be introduced because if you see the WIPO strategy paper uh, on the patent granting, the, all the developed countries, including OECD countries, uh, have already implemented whatever list I have just put before you. Only th thing is we have to break the uh, uh, you know, stereotype and think big and move ahead and to encourage our policies and our own stakeholders. You know, if you read the best of the best research papers uh, in innovation, analyzing the national innovation policies, you see whether it is EU, US or EU or any OECD countries, the very innovation policy and investment are inextricably interlinked. Because uh, that is not happening in India. We have set the target of 2% R&D investment. If you see the latest Global Innovation Index India chapter, we are somewhere 1.76. We are not achieved the 2 point power. When you are planning, this is the Amrit Kaal, we are seriously committed under the leadership of Honorable Sri Narendra Modi to make India a developed country, Vikasit Bharat. For that, 
we need to achieve at least average 4% government grant for R&D investment. Otherwise, we can't see. We can't see India at the top. We can't achieve that status. You know, we should leave that developing country mentality that, you know, 2% is enough. You know, we have to move forward. Government grants to be included. And my friend Anjan was mentioning, I think, uh, even Dev Jani <coughs> about private funding. Private funding is to be, you know, high tech and every, now the disruptive technologies are knocking at the door. AI is everywhere. Now Web 3.0 is coming. It, it decentralized internet is going to change every businesses, not only the FinTech or every businesses, ICT industry or pharma industry, every kind of innovation going to be. We should get low cost ICT facility, that should be our aim. See, Web 3.0, uh, it, 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 it is based on artificial intelligence, machine learning, edge computing, internet of things, and of course, 5G. 5G is already available, uh, already come in, uh, it's already entered. Uh, so we need to have policies. So uh, national IP policy, Creative India, Innovative in India facilitates the uh, ideas, the strategy for awareness is important. I mean, we have to increase the patent filing. You know, the latest uh, data on patent filing, India is the ninth largest resident patent filing data we have got. 31.6% increase in patent filing. It's a really disruptive thing happened when Prime Minister Modi ji has tweeted this information. I just woke up and started searching for the reports and data. And I was so happy. But this need to be sustained means we should have national IP policy working uh, along with the state IP policies. You know, couple of weeks only, Dr. Maslekar, and everyone know him, this contribution in intellectual property rights and, and, and traditional knowledge, uh, digital library creation, and, and uh, his fight for, um, you know, the Haldi patent and all, and Neem patent uh, invalidation. Because lack of uh, and state policies uh, with the minimum standards and objectives uh, communicated by the national policies, states are lacking in this. Of course, in startup field, something different achieved. In the startup ecosystem, as already Chintan has mentioned, uh, that each state has its policy and state ranking of uh, you know startup uh, has been comments and the Gujarat. Uh, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, the leading startup uh, innovating states. And then we have more than 1 lakh um, 12,740 startups are there. Maybe while I'm addressing to you, one new startup may be getting registered. And India has the third largest startup ecosystem. And third largest unicorns, we have under, recently 111th unicorn has been recognized. India uh, has five known megacron, which crossed the 10 billion mark of the startups. So this need to be sustained and promoted. For this, we have to think big and break the stereotype. So what I see, if these things are done, and one thing I forgot, in 2008 we failed uh, the, with the bill which was wrongly drafted, public funded research bill. We simply tried to uh, copy and paste the Bedol Act of the USA. That was a mistake, but then because the Parliamentary Standing Committee came down heavily on that and suggested around 100 uh, recommendations to uh, amend that, and that was withdrawn. Now there is a need to uh, encourage public funded uh, uh, research partnership universities private investment and foreign funding. Uh, 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 you know, uh, everyone was talki uh, talking about the incentives for the in private innovation. You know, uh, that is very, very important. 
and uh, my friend uh, Anjan was mentioning that is not working. I to see what is the problem in that policy, how we can improve uh, at the level of developed countries and OECD countries. And third most important thing is government itself in uh, not only the um, uh, increasing the grants, uh, as I said earlier, 2 to 4% in R&D, government should involve in the key niche areas. Example, US. US government funds in Google research, Google funding. And then they try to help them to uh, spread that knowledge and market and commercialize. These kind of steps, India need to be taken to be, uh, when, during this Amritra call, to make India a Vixit Bharat, a developed country. Thank you very much. Jai Hind. Thank you, thank you very much, and thank you to all the panelists for uh, their their inputs, their insights. I think we've got some excellent points. I'll take a minute to summarize the key ones. I think across all the panelists, the one thing, the one message that really stood out, and Chintan, you you brought it out very clearly, is if we want to move forward and we want to move up the GII index, India needs to have a one India approach to innovation. We cannot have the current siloed approach or fragmented approach uh, hold us back anymore. And this is a fundamental change that is needed. We have to have a One India approach where we are connecting the dots, where we are building an innovation network across the country that will allow people to share, to, 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 to discuss, to connect. Um, I think this is going to be absolutely critical and also bring about what, again, the point Chintan mentioned, bring about a certain level of of uniformity uh, in, in the processes that are used to manage or, or catalyze innovation, and, and we've seen how fragmented they are. Uh, I think another point which, uh, which, which Anjan called out, which is very important, is uh, in how states think and how they report out, there needs to be a fundamental shift, a shift towards more focus on innovation parameters with clear goals, which is academic excellence, R&D, not just investments, but outcome. Uh, the IPR ecosystem, and uh, Dr. Raghavendra, I would say we need expedited patent grants for everyone. Uh, waiting five years for a deep tech patent just, just doesn't make sense anymore. I think India has to figure out how to do this. And I also like the point about MSME you know, involvement in the entire ecosystem, which is critical. Um, I think the third thing we talked about was policy and how there's a need for policy innovation, especially as we get into an era where technology uh, advancements are going to change way faster than what we humans or regulators are able to keep up with. India needs to embrace a policy sandbox ecosystem as we are looking at technology, ever-changing technology, and we have to look at policy and regulation not from the legacy mindset of preventing risks, but from a new mindset of unlocking opportunities with the right oversight. I think that's a huge change that is required in the way we look at policies. Uh, we talked about processes like procurement reforms, and this is important because, uh, you know, when you talk to startups, the biggest grip that they have is that you, they want to buy inno you know, innovative solutions, but then they want L1 innovation. You can't, you can't, you know, deal with L1 innovation. That's not going to work. Um, and I think we absolutely have to change this mindset. Um, we, we also talked about, um, you know, the talent, the human. Uh, Ananta talked about the human capital, which I think is so important because in, in this age of AI, I think the biggest driving force behind AI has to be human ingenuity. And we cannot forget that that is India's biggest strength. We have to continue to build on it. Uh, we talked about capital. India needs to figure out a way to build patient capital for deep tech. Uh, we've been talking very long about it, but now is the time to get this done. And I would just like to say that, you know, all of this is so important, but at the end of the day, it has to get enforced. 
it has to get implemented, everything that we talked about. And in order to enforce it, whether it is approving patents or it is setting up processes to drive innovation at states, you need capabilities. You need people who understand innovation. And I think one of the biggest challenges ahead of us right now, as we think through how to build that one India mindset, is growing the capabilities at the grassroots levels, be it in our patent offices, approving officers, or the people who work with startups, so that they understand innovation and they are able to talk the language of innovation. I hope I have summarized what we have discussed. Uh, but with that, a huge thanks and a round of applause to the panelists. I think they did a fantastic job. And thank you very much. If the chairperson would kindly agree, maybe we have time for a couple of questions from the, from the states especially. Yeah, please. No, I'll be as brief as possible and thank you for the opportunity because the states are probably the missing element. Uh, uh, I'm Sandeep Verma, I'm additional chief secretary, I look after science technology department, the government of Rajasthan. And I'm going to make this quick because the PM wanted a dialogue and that's, that's not happened so far between states and between Niti Aayog, for instance, on the matter. So I'll just pick up a few points from what Anjan mentioned, from what Chintan mentioned, from Devjani you mentioned on the subject, down to the last week, on IPR subjects. Uh, right, I'll, I'll use the mic. So, one thing that Suman Berry uh, talked about was homegrown innovation, right? Um, one thing that Saraswat Sar talked about was innovation driving growth. So, the issue is really whose innovation is driving whose growth. And, and when we say we are a growing economy, where is the innovation happening that is growing the economy? Is it a homegrown innovation driven growth in the economy? because you can always grow by importing innovation. I think somewhere the challenge re is really for, for India when we talk about what the Prime Minister's vision is, how do we move from being an importer and a consumer of innovation that's happening outside to a producer and an exporter of innovative solutions from India, out of India. And one point, for instance, Hanjan, and I'm going to focus on that because you, Devjani, also mentioned it, is the public procurement of innovation. Uh, now, there's a huge theory and practice of law that focuses on procurement of innovation and how do you integrate into public procurement systems. The Americans have done it through a SBE, small business set aside for donkey's years. They have something also called the Bayh-Dole Act, which is really how is, how, where does the IPR West when government funds or there's public funding involved. So if you look at the IPR policy of 2016, it has a clause saying we will put in place a system that encourages commercialization of IPRs. But it's been eight years and we don't have, we are nowhere close to a Baidol model in India, which is really, really required because I mean, there are small amounts of funds that are being spent by states, but that's not translating into something more than that. So how do you integrate and how do you bring innovation, manufacturing, and R&D and procurement systems together? I think that's where probably it's, it's just, I mean, I'm, I'm no, I'm no great expert on the subject, but I think the idea is that uh, instead of saying government should spend mandatorily an X some percentage of their funds on R&D, I think it would be better if we say government should mandatorily spend a certain 0.5% of your funds on procuring innovation. Instead of saying we'll, we'll, because the investment is going to follow procurement. If I, if I see something interesting happening in government, but if that's not going to get bought eventually, I'm not going to invest. The invest is not, not going to put his money in that. And if you follow the progression of, and if you just compare what's happened to space research in India versus defense manufacturing in India, I think the difference becomes very clear. Because space, what's happened in the space sector is really homegrown innovation. And what's happening in defense is we're still importing platforms and systems and so on. And I think that's basically happening because there's a very fundamental disconnect between R&D and procurement and manufacturing in the defense ministry rules versus how the space uh, sector runs it out. So, so there are a huge range of solutions that are possible. Going from, you know, telling states, here is a model bait all provision, put it in your contracts, to saying, spend this much money at least, with 1%, half a percent, 2%, a uh, nominal amount of money, procuring innovative solutions. You talk about startups, right? We deal with, we have, we have a growing number of startups in Rajasthan. The common problem is, how do I get into your procurement system? Is, 
the procurement system could be L1, it could be QCBS and so on and so forth. Um, I, um, I apologize for taking too much time, but I think somewhere what can states do? I think that discussion is something that would be very, very valuable. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comments. I appreciate that. Uh, with that, yeah, I If there is no one else... Uh, Thank you very much. I am Dr. Anand Mishra, Director of Planning Government of UP. Uh, in one of the uh, slides, uh, Chintamani Ji has just shown that ki UP was very good in the startup and the incubation center. And another slide, it was when it was uh, with Pal Lakh population, it was depleted uh, UP's position. So my concern is that ki, you know, what you, uh, because you have only the 10,000 labs, uh, all over the India. So you have to increase, if you want to increase the UP's position for one lakh, one lakh populations, because we always just uh, in the bottom line when we divide with the population or, or anything else. So you have to do something like that. Another issue is patent. Patent is very difficult for the concerned person to how to go for the patent. Uh, this is the very biggest problem. And third is the village label. If you want really to uh, go for the 25th ranks, you have to think about the village where we have 70% population. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. And I know we have a f hard stop across a few panelists. So thank you very much for uh, the patient hearing. And thanks again to all the panelists. Do you want to answer that, by the way? Um, yes, sure. Can I just say something very quickly? Yes, yes. Uh, well, so I think um, uh, to the earlier point, um, uh, just uh, three very quick observations. First, I think the procurement is a cultural nut we have to crack. We know what to do. Uh, to Anjan's point, can we have a state who will become the champion in procurement? Then others will follow, I feel. Uh, but uh, unless that procurement happens, we cannot really close the loop on boosting the startup ecosystem, taking it to the next level. Second point, one very important point you made was whose innovation and for whom. I think uh, what we are seeing with Atal Tinkering Labs is something very fascinating. Last Sunday, I was in Srinagar. There were 127 ATLs who came together. Um, first, well, I think the types of problems these kids picked uh, I, I realized in speaking to some of them that those are problems that nobody else in this country will solve for them. For example, how do I know there is carbon monoxide poisoning and automatically open my windows because there's gas heating all across Kashmir? This is not a problem most people in the country just simply know about. It. Uh, how do I know how much snow accumulation is there and what are the temperature changes so that the flash floods I can predict for the villages downstream? Nobody will uh, work on these problems for them. That's really encouraging to see. We, uh, uh, we also had one team that had done a benchtop apple grading system, which when they came to show it to us, some months ago, I had wondered what will happen to this idea now. So surprised to find that a local garage is helping them build a real system. This is the kind of ecosystem that is in Chicago and Michigan and you know all of these uh, places where these large companies came about. So very, very encouraging. Final thought is I think this, uh, to your point, absolutely right, in our estimation, one in three schools must have a tinkering lab. That means 70,000 labs. It took us 10,000, five years to build 10,000. We have to build uh, another five years, we have to build another 60,000, for example, and open it up. Because I think that's where one thing that you do see happening is that somebody who would have otherwise in their normal course of life become a consumer becomes, begins to think that I am a producer. I think we have to do much more of that. Thank you. With this, we have reached the conclusion of our first panel discussion, and I trust it has been a tremendous learning opportunity for our fellow states and UTs. Ma'am, for the I request Dr. Neeraj Singh.